thank you. So we're going to take a field poll um, just to kind of get an idea, um, kind of everybody's interest in this class. Um, how many people out there have kids that are K through 12? Okay, keep your hands up. How many people had kids K through 12? How many people think they're going to have kids go through K through 12? How many people know teachers or faculty members that work at schools, K through 12 colleges? So you can see by the show of hands, Daniel and I both have kids that are starting K through 12. So that you can see just in this audience that there's a lot of people where schools actually touch each and one of us. Chemical Safety Board has been gathering data um, on laboratory explosions. Um, right now they have 120 laboratory explosions where people got injured, there's property damage, there's fires. Chemical Safety Board also found out it's the lack of training that are causing these explosions. And I have a couple scenarios. Um, in 2010, there was an explosion at Texas Tech, severely injured a graduate student, lost three fingers and an eye damage, or some, suffered some eye damage. And then this is not only happening just in colleges. In, in a prep school in 2013, a female student was burned from head to toe during a lab experiment where her science teacher was trying to ignite cobalt. It didn't work, so he added methanol to cause the explosion. In 2014, five boys at a prep school in Colorado were severely injured with one severely burned during a methanol experiment by the school teacher. Once again, the teachers not being trained on this, going to the internet, looking at YouTube, trying to do these experiments where te not only the teachers, but the students are getting injured. Mismanagement of hazardous materials and hazardous waste also affects the environment. It impacts our drinking water, it causes fish kills, and it also is a major source of pollution. So in this incident right here, down here, we had illegal disposal of used oil into a storm drain, which was, was upstream of the American River in Sacramento. Right there, that's a little fish. We had a contractor that was dechlorinating water. It was supposed to be following some protocol with his NPDES permit. Um, due to lack of training and oversight, he discharged the wastewater at a 2.3 pH into this retention pond, killing all the fish. And also, mismanagement of hazardous materials and hazardous waste has a penalty. Um, you can see right there, hazardous waste violations add up really fast. I think a lot of people have been seeing the press releases in the retail stores where retail stores are paying millions of dollars on mismanagement and illegal disposal of hazardous waste. But it's just not the retail stores. Um, in 2013, 2012, a school district in Riverside County paid a $2,500 fine for hazardous materials business plan and hazardous just this past year in Sacramento, another school district paid a $2,000 fine for hazardous materials business plan violations. And in 2011, a private college up in Northern California mismanaged some hazardous waste, disposed of illegally some hazardous waste, and also didn't implement their SDCC plan and between cost and penalty paid a $200,000 fine. So schools have limited budgets. They don't have monopoly money like this that they can just start paying off penalty after penalty. So when you start finding schools, we're cutting into their budget. We're cutting into education for students. So what's one way school districts can think about this? Maybe some forward thinking, a compliance program. How much waste are they going to generate? Is it waste? So Daniel and I want to welcome you to keeping schools out of detention. Hazmat 101, or Hazmat Compliance 101. Um, this course is when we first were asked to do this course, we were told this was going to be industry. Once we started looking at the class list, it was a little bit of industry and also regulators. So as we were doing this presentation, we want to kind of touch all bases. So we're going to start off first kind of giving the background of what's a CUPA, what's a hazardous materials business plan, what's, what's hazardous waste. And then we're going to get into some common violations, you know, for the basic inspectors that are just starting to get into this. What are we seeing in schools? You know, what are the violations, labeling, lack of training? disposal issues. And then we have some for the seasoned ins inspectors out there. We're going to get into benchtop neutralization, acid neutralization tanks, and tier permitting. Okay, 
it's going to be in video form for a long time. Sorry about that. So how long is, how big is this problem? So 2012, 2013 data from California State says we have 16, over 1,600 public high schools servicing 1.7 million students. Um, just over 1,400 middle schools that serve just about a million students. And then we have 330 colleges and universities, and they service about 3 million students. So about a third of those are community colleges, over half are private colleges and universities, and under 10% are the UC and Cal State system. So like I said, what's a Koopa? So when we come into these school districts, when we say we're part of the Koopa, they kind of give us the deer and headlight look, well, what's a Koopa? Koopa was um, implemented back in 1993. The first Koopas were certified in 96. But our goals of Koopa are to achieve, achieve consistency. We unified the program for inspections, permits, and enforcement for hazardous materials and hazardous business. So the Koopa also regulates not only hazardous materials business plan and release reporting and hazardous waste, but the CalR program, the USTs, which you will see at some of the corp yards at universities and also some high schools, um, above ground tank, ASPA, APSA, same thing. You might see some schools, definitely some colleges in the APSA program, and then the uniform fire code. So hazardous materials business plan. This is a program that was intended to help public health, the environment, the EPCO right to know, community right to know well. Um, we're dealing with reportable quantities of hazardous materials, 55 gallons, 500 pounds, 200 cubic feet. So you say, what is a hazardous material? Well, right in Health and Safety Code, it tells us what a hazardous material is. Based on the quantity, concentration, or physical or chemical characteristics of a material that may poten present potential or significant harm to public health or the environment if released. So this also includes hazardous substances and hazardous waste. So how do you identify a hazardous material? Well, it's easy. Label, SDS, and list of list. Um, I say it's easy, but a lot of times we do get arguments. Is this a hazardous material? Is sand a hazardous material? Take a look at the SDS and the label. Something new with the HM, well, something new with the HMP, HMPB program is electronic reporting, SIRS. Um, all hazardous materials business plans now are electronically uploaded either through SIRS or like in Sacramento County, we have our own portal. So there's other Koopas that have portals that electronically up this, this stores the data. So for all the school districts out there, find out what your county has. Do they have a portal? Do they go through SIRS? So the components of the hazardous materials business plan, the first thing is gonna be the facility information. It's the business operator section, also the business activity section. The second part's gonna be the hazardous materials inventory. That includes the inventory sheets, what's in reportable quantities, along with the site map, telling you where things are, where's the emergency evacuation area. And the last part would be the emergency response plan and actually employee training plans. So the second program we're gonna talk about that we see at schools is hazardous waste. Um, it is either a listed RICRA hazardous waste or a presumptive hazardous waste in Title 22 for non RICRA waste, or it's going to be characteristic, so reactive. That means it undergoes a violent or explodes readily or undergoes a violent reaction. Um, it's either corrosive, so it has a pH of 2 or less, or 12 and a half or greater. It's ignitable, has a flash point of 140 degrees Fahrenheit or less, or is it toxic? It contains some metals that will fail the T clip totals or the STLC analysis, or it will fail a 96-hour bio, aquatic bioassay, otherwise known as the Fishco test. So when you're making a waste determination or when you are generating waste, there's four principles you got to figure out that you are required to do to make a waste determination. The first thing you're going to say is, do I have a waste here? Is it spent material? Is it going to be used for its intended purpose? If it's still good material, it's not a waste. But if it, you can't use it for its intended purpose or if it's spent, it's a waste. The second part is the waste exempted. So an example of that would be excluded recycled materials. Can it be recycled? No, it can't be recycled. So then you're going to go down to the third question. Is the waste listed? So is it federally listed as a RICRA waste? Or is it found in Appendix X in Title 22 as a presumptive waste for California? 
the final one, like in the last slide, is it a characteristic of hazardous waste? Is it toxic, corrosive, reactive, pragmatic? Also with hazardous waste, there's a lot of strict management um, practices, not only on the generator side, so at the point of generation, which would be the cradle, but you also have licensed hazardous waste haulers, you have disposal facilities called treatment storage and disposal facilities. So there's a, a common term out there called cradle to grave for hazardous waste. Also with hazardous waste, you have different statuses. Are you a large quantity generator or a conditionally exempt small quantity generator? So with that, it depends on how much you make or how much you generate. If you generate over 1,000 kilograms or 270 gallons a month, you're a large quantity generator and you're held to things like biannual report, source reduction plan, detailed documented training. I mean, it has to be detailed, it has to be kept. Records have to be kept for three years. You also can only store your hazardous waste for 90 days. Or if you're conditionally exempt, you're, you're generating less than 27 gallons a month. You get the option of taking it to a local house, household hazardous waste facility, you know, if you make an appointment. So there's different requirements for large quantity, small quantity, and conditionally exempt small quantity. So you're probably wondering, well, it's a school. What can be in a school? I mean, um, this was a scheduled inspection, and this was a school. Um, not kind of what you would, you know, a little bit of auto shop, some compressed ass cylinders, some more right down here. So this is industrial arts, wood shop, metal shop, auto shop. So let's go take a look at the art class. They have paint lockers. We have ceramics, glazes. This is a paint locker in one of the high schools. And then the, the last one would be science buildings. So if you look in a fume hood, you find these little blue bottles with the non-filled out hazardous waste label. We'll go through this a little bit later, but this is always fun to see underneath the fume hood. What is that? Um, when you start asking teachers, you get the deer and headlight look. They don't know. Um, and then also chemical storage in the chemistry department. I'm Daniel, how are you guys doing today? Good. Just to get an idea, who's from, who's Managing schools, who are regulators, show of hands to schools. Great, it's a good turnout. And regulators, wow, quite a few. Okay, so like Robert was saying, we catered this presentation towards schools and identifying hazardous waste. Uh, we also have some concepts later on that we're going to talk about covering things like remote consolidation, if that's applicable to schools. Um, uh, another one is uh, bench top treatment. Uh, Robert alluded to how that works, if schools are allowed to do it, who's doing it, what are the rules pertaining to it. So as you see from the slide, these are the classes, a quick overview of the classes that we're going to be covering. We're going to go through fine arts, industrial arts, PE, miscellaneous, miscellaneous areas, oddball classes, and the sciences is the bulk of the presentation really. Um, there's a lot of issues that we found in sciences, so we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that. Also, remote consolidation, as I alluded to, the SHW, this is Schools Hazardous Waste Collection Consolidation Accumulation Facilities. I'm coining a new term for this. It's going to be SHOCAF, just for ease of use. Um, then we're going through inspection preparation, what to expect during inspection, and then common, common violations that we found and ways to mitigate those violations. And please, if you have any questions, please chime in. Um, we know quite a bit about schools' waste streams, but there are definitely things that we don't know. Any questions, audience? Sure. Yeah, so the, yeah, so the gentleman is talking about pools and maintenance facilities. We are going to cover that in physical education and miscellaneous areas as well, so we'll get to that. All right, first topic, fine arts. So what are the common things we find Find in fine arts? A lot of paints, glazes potentially. Um, paints being the majority of the waste that they may generate. Um, on the left, you can see a shelf of glazes used in ceramic class. On the right, those are acrylic paints used in art class, potentially some wet glazes as well. Art 
class. So what you'll see are a lot of water-based paints being used, acrylic or tempera. Also, there are oil-based paints for any oil paintings they potentially use. So in the process of painting, they usually generate some type of wash solution from the paintbrushes themselves. Have they made a hazardous waste determination on the wash waters? Um, potentially, if they're washing down the sink, water-based stuff usually isn't that big of an issue, but teachers and school administrators need to know if it's hazardous waste or not. Uh, Oil-based stuff, sometimes you use solvents to soak in the water. I think they work for those paintbrushes, so they use solvents, and solvents usually have a high black point percentage of the toxicity, so they need to make a waste determination on any wash solutions that are reported in the drain. Um, most of the time when we ask these questions, they say it's non-toxic, the paint's non-toxic, look at the bottle, it says non-toxic, and that may be the case, but they need to know, they need to know why it's non-toxic. They need to make that waste determination. And waste determination is something we're going to be hammering throughout the presentation. Is it a waste? Is it a hazardous waste? And as Robert talked about, there's criteria, criteria for determining if it's a hazardous waste. Um, There's some good pictures coming up. So on the left, you can see a sink. And this is quite a big, a large sink for an art facility. So that kind of encourages that people are washing paintbrushes here, um, which is kind of strange. I mean, maybe they have determined that it's not hazardous, but just the size of it, the sheer size of it, feels like it's made for washing brushes. On the top right of the, of the picture, you'll see the paintbrushes, and then you'll see a lot of steam in the sink itself with the paint. Um, this school, I'm not sure how common it is, but for this school, on the picture on the right, for this school, they're doing some airbrushing. And they have airbrushing done in this area right here, and they have a vent to exhaust any overspray. Um, so the overspray goes in here into the piping and to a different room. Um, so potentially, have, they have a filter that's capturing any overspray paint. Has a hazardous waste determination they made on the paint and those filters themselves. So there's, there's some common questions to ask. What wastes are generated? How are they being managed? Are they hazardous or not? Um, yes, sir. The ones we've seen are water-based as well. Um, I don't think any of them are oil-based, but the ones that we've seen so far are water-based. But like I said, it may be non-hazardous. That probably is the case, but they need to know that it is non-hazardous and be able to document and prove that it's not. Just something to ask. One other thing that's interesting about this school is when we looked at the paints, it actually said the, op the person must have a respirator. So that, but that we were thinking this is what the system is set up for, is that they don't have to have the respirator with this system set up. But that was one of the things when we were looking at the paint, it actually says wear a respirator. And we didn't observe any respirators. That's probably, it's a safety issue for sure. Yes. So the question is what test they would need, they would recommend for it. Um, a test isn't required to be done. They can look at SDSs and make that determination using general knowledge that works. If they want to go above and beyond, they can potentially do a CAM 17 test if there's any metals in the paint that's being used. Um, if they want to go further, they can do 96 hour fish bioassay test as well. And sometimes if you're using flammable paints, mattability, so just like um, body shops, like they have the spray booths, you're gonna look at ignitability. You know, does the metal, is there a potential this metal has heavy metals in it? Um, not sure, you gotta look at the metals. But the same thing with this, with spray paints and stuff, you, these are flammable paints, so you're gonna wanna look at ignitability. And like Daniel was saying, they can use generator knowledge, it's all based on what you're seeing out there. Um, to tell if someone came to me and says it doesn't contain heavy metals, it's going to say, well, where did you get that from? Did you get that from an SDS or did you actually do analytical on it? So it, it's kind of, you got to use your judgment when you're out there. Take a look at the, what they have, what they're saying. They, they might be highly competent in other things. They might just be shooting at the hip, but that's your decision out there to make. Both. The, the used paint itself, if they determine it's not usable anymore, the container's broken, they can't use that product itself. 
that would need to make that waste determination at that point. Also with any cleaning of any equipment, the wash solutions that they're using for cleaning the brushes in this instance, they would need to make a waste determination as well. I mean, sometimes there's solvents that are being used for oil based paints, so it's things they need to, to look at and evaluate. Yeah, we have more photos. We'll show, I mean, this is our class, so some of the paints are clearly not toxic in here, but we'll get into some of the, the wood shop and the stains and all that where we are dealing with flammability issues. Any other questions about art class? We're gonna move on to ceramics now. All right, ceramics, they typically are, schools are typically keeping a reportable quantity of clays. Um, it's one of those things like Robert was saying about sand being hazardous material, clay potentially could be hazardous material as well. Um, not usually in a wet form, but in a dry form. Um, another name for clay that's industry term is kaolin. Uh, so clay could potentially be an inhalation hazard and cause silicosis if the silica dust gets into your lungs. It can cause respiratory, issue, respiratory issues, be a chronic disease. Um, on the, so on the left, you can see the wet clay storage over here. They're kept in bags. Usually they're moist and kept in boxes as well. So if they have 500 pounds of the wet clay, they may need to submit a hazardous material inventory sheet. On the right is dry clay. Some schools, they reconstitute dry clay just for a cost savings measure. If the clay is dried out, they'll usually rehydrate it with water and try to rework the water in there so it's still usable again. Um, in the classroom that we inspected, a teacher said they would never subject themselves to working with the dry clay because it does pick up a lot of dust when you're reworking it. She says it's just cheaper to, to buy new clay at $7.50 a bag. So it, it's commonly known to be inhalation hazard among the ceramics teachers, so they typically have measures in place to mitigate those issues. And ceramics, uh, the major hazardous material that they're working with potentially is wet glazes. On occasion, teachers do work with dry glazes as well, just to make their own custom pigments. And we've done some research on dry glazes and there have been issues with if it's not prepared correctly can potentially kick up toxic fumes to both the teachers and subject them to the students as well. Uh, also in the glazes there may be heavy metals like lead, cadmium, and barium to look out for. So if they're cleaning out, purging old dry glazes they may, may need to wait, they will, will need to make a hazardous waste determination to make sure there's no heavy metals that may trigger to be hazardous waste so they can find out if they need to manage it as a hazardous waste or if it's just normal solid waste at that point. So question again, has a hazardous waste determination been made on the glazes prior to disposal? Sorry, having some issues with this one, right? Okay, so on the left, you'll see some pictures of dry glazes an issue that we've seen are that the containers themselves sometimes aren't marked properly. Um, like I said, there's issues with heavy metals with some dry glazes that they're using to make custom pigments. Um, in this case, in some clear jars marked as Sharpie. Uh, on the right, I can skip this on the earlier slide, but the kilns themselves, some of them are propane powered. So if they're keeping a reportable quantity of propane, that may be something they need to report on a hazardous material plan as well. Uh, most cases, they're electric powered or natural gas plumbed. So in those cases, there would be no issues with storage of compressed gas cylinders. And they're typically stored outside as well, just outside the, the ceramics room. So um, they keep them in a well-ventilated area because they do um, exhaust out carbon monoxide, and formaldehyde, formaldehyde gases, and some other gases as well. Photography, so it's less and less common now that facilities are using uh, photochemical processes for developing film. Most, of, most schools are moving over to digital now, and so this is maybe a less common thing, but there's still a major waste stream that's coming from photography, and that's the photo, photo fixer waste with silver. Um, a lot of schools are managing that as hazardous waste, the photo fixer solution itself. Some have a silver recovery unit that is capturing the silver and that's being recycled typically. Um, 
one case, one of our schools, they were inspecting a photography lab. Um, the inspector was actually asking questions about um, if there's any silver recovery units on site, and she discovered that there was one actually underground. Um, so it's, every school is handled differently. There's, they're all built differently. So that's one question to ask is if you're doing inspection, how, how is silver being managed? Are they just hang, handling the photo fixer solution as hazardous waste? Is there a silver recovery unit? You can take a look at the silver recovery unit. Is it potentially underground? Yeah, the inspector was actually, they had the waste hauler out there and they were investigating the acid neutralization tank off the science building. And when the hauler got out there, the first thing he said is, well, I don't service this tank. I service this one over here. And the inspectors had no idea that there was an even tank over there. And then, yeah, when we were there going through the manifest, they were actually pulling silver waste out of that tank. So that was one thing that was missed on the initial walkthrough, but then the hauler identified where that tank was. So ask questions. Um, if they don't have an accumulation container or if you start seeing manifest for something, but they don't have a tank or a container that you saw, just start asking questions. Any other questions? Any, any questions about photography? Are you cut and dry? Question? Yeah, so silver only requirements, there is a silver only requirement in health and safety code that allows you to um, capture the silver and, dis and dispose of it as on the bill of lading. Um, I also have some notes. Did you, is there anything specific you wanted to cover with that? Yeah, so it does not re require a tiered permitting, um, tiered permit to, uh, to recover the silver. They can dispose of it on a regular manifest and that's not something that's required. But one of the things you do have to do is if you are gonna treat for the silver is notify the sewer department before you get your discharge permit. Yeah, they usually re reclaim the silver and then they discharge a photo fix or waste without the silver down the drain. Is there another question? Uh, well, it, it, this just recently happened, um, so no, it wasn't regulated. No, they're not doing this anymore. Um, so it was just identified probably in the last month. Um, they've gone over to digital now and actually don't use that tank. So I'm not 100% sure what actually is going forward after that. It was just something literally, as we were finalizing this presentation, the inspector came over and gave us a story and told us all about this. So. And they were managing the photo fixer waste that was in that underground tank as a hazardous waste. So they. Were they knew it was hazardous waste and they were getting picked up. But like, like Robert was saying, they no longer do that process anymore. Yes, sir. Typically, I see poly containers. Um, and that's only, I actually, I only have seen them in poly containers. I've never seen them in metal containers. So there may be compatibility issues with metal itself. Yeah, every inspection I've seen with photo waste, it's actually been. Potentially, yeah. Yeah. As long as the closed container has your space label. Yeah. So on the left, there's a photo lab, just a dark room that's being used. That's where they do the photo processing itself. On the right, there's developer and then photo fixer waste, photo fixer solution with silver. Those are both new products. Okay. So the next class in fine arts that we're going to talk about is theater. The major hazardous material kept in theater are the paints. So you'll see a lot of water-based paints, oil-based paints potentially, stains that are used to paint props in the theater. Um, also aerosol cans are something you need to look out for as well for you when they do any type of spot painting, smaller projects. Uh, question to ask is how are they managing the non-empty non -empty aerosol cans? Uh, so it's aerosol cans with potentially some product in it, but maybe damaged the nozzle, maybe a broken off or something. Um, and also paint related materials, thinners, brushes. How are they managing those? Um, in the larger theater departments, also maybe storing reportable quantity of compressed gases for any type of special effect smoke, like liquid CO2 or liquid nitrogen as well. So that's something to look out for. Got some good pictures. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. 
you're talking about non-empty with product still in there or empty? Yeah, usually if they're empty and propellant is gone, like you're saying, there may be some residual propellant in there or something, it could be handled as solid waste. It's not a hazardous waste or universal waste at that point. So it can be disposed of. Municipal trash, yeah, if it's empty. You could handle them as universal waste at that point if you can't find a hazardous waste or I mean, a trash company to come pick them up. You can handle them as universal waste if that's an issue. And hazardous waste haulers usually pick them up as well. But if you have aerosol cans that need to be disposed of, that's probably the route to go. Okay, so for this facility, this school that we visited on the left, they have a spe they have special effects smoke as well, but they're not using any compressed gasoline like the liquid CO2. Nitrogen. They are using this newer machine that uses glycol and just regular ice or dry ice. So that's something to look out for. It's just you know, right here. We have two of them. They're both dry. In the bottom picture, you can see a pretty nasty sink with. It's obvious that they're cleaning either brushes or equipment. What you can't see to the right of it is a paint gun that they were cleaning out. Um, so, and in speaking with the theater teacher that was there. Couldn't give us any good answers as far as what was going on there. It was water based, solvent based. So, those, those are questions to ask. What's going on the drain? What, what are you guys using? What type of paints? What type of stains are you getting? Uh, top right, it's the paint supply that we found in the backstage of the theater as well. So, they're keeping quite a bit of paint. I mean, they have miscellaneous areas where they keep different types of paints. Um, this school had an issue with. Corrected it now, but they had an issue with because they accepted donated paint from parents in the past. So the parents would just give them everything, anything and everything, and so they couldn't manage it properly. They couldn't make, they couldn't tell what was usable, what's not usable. And they just had a raft load of paint stored at the facility. So instead, the, the way to get out of that is just to keep paints that are needed. So what they do now is just buy as needed. Um, so they don't have to issue of managing any things that may be wastes at that point. All right, so industrial arts, this is we'll, talk, we'll talk about the auto shop, metal shop, um, wood shop, carpentry, that type of deal, um, construction as well. Uh, you see a picture on the left, there's a lot of compressed gas cylinders at this particular metal shop. Um, as you can see in our open containers, the oil on the right is a cart that obviously had some oil on it prior to it raining. You can see a nice milky, milky sheen on the top. In auto shops, since most of us are regulators, we deal with a lot of auto shops and schools are no different. They have a lot of the typical waste, the waste, waste streams and products. So we're gonna look at oils, antifreezes, use oil, use antifreezes, oil filters. So if you're managing school, double check the auto shop, make sure if there's any reportable quantities that are kept there that they're being reported properly on hazardous material inventory sheets. Um, question to ask is how are those wastes being managed? Are they kept in a closed container, labeled properly, disposed of within the proper accumulation time limit? Are the disposal receipts being kept at the school for inspector review? Also, brake rotor grinding. It's the same same deal with auto shops. Has a waste determination been made on any brake rotor grindings? A lot of the auto shops that we run across are doing that procedure as well. And we'll touch more on that in the next slide in metal in metal shop. So metal shop. Does it have a reportable quantity of any compressed gases or lubricating oils? Um, are the gas cylinders being secured properly? Are incompatibles like oxygen and acetylene being kept separate? And the same deal. Um, they do a lot of CNC. They may do a lot of CNC work or metal working with lathes. So they're creating metal dusts. Um, and DTSC has a definition of scrap metal. It's anything that's less than 100 microns or microliters. 
um, does not meet that def definition of a scrap metal. And those metal grindings potentially may have heavy metals segregate out from them. So lead, barium, um, potentially could be coming out from that waste stream. So a waste determination needs to be made on metal grindings as well. And GTSE made that definition of scrap metal back in 1999. Um, and they excluded any fine, finely divided metals. So any type of powdery consistency we need to look at those waste streams and make sure that there is no issues with metals toxicity. Yes, question. Yes, we have. Um, not at schools, but regular auto shops have tested their finely divided metals from the brake lathe. They have come back hot. Or heavy metals so they have failed them in the past it really depends on what loaders you're grinding but since auto shops work with work with different manufacturers of grindings there's that potential for heavy metals to segregate out so the question was does the state exempt brake road brake rotor grindings not that i I've heard or know of. Yeah, no, um, I mean, if it's under that, that 100 micro, then, and, and if it also contains heavy metals, I mean, the last I've heard, it, it's considered a hazardous place. I mean, if there's something new, that would be something we would like to know. But, um, Does anyone else, has anyone else heard of the, any exemption for brake rotor grindings? <laughs> Cherry pie? <laughs> Raspberry pie? <laughs> yeah. Uh, typically CAM 17, so it's the California metal 17. So what was asked was what kind of test would you run on brake grinding? So you're going to look at the um, metal. So for state, you're going to be doing a, a CAM 17 of totals. Um, possibly an SDLC is um, a wet test. Um, for the feds, you're going to be doing a T-clip. Um, uh, yeah, the sieve test would probably capture the finely divided metals from that sample. So that would test the micron level at least. So like I said, anything less than 100 microns would need to be looked at with the to be made. Um, on the left is the is an example of a brake rotor uh, lathe. So you would put the rotor on the spindle itself be a metal bit that shaves off a portion of the brake rotor to make it true again. It's typically a warped. Um, and then the actual metal grinding could fall into this funnel and you'd capture it into some type of container. We've seen issues with auto shops and then not keeping it in a closed container. Um, usually we, we don't mind it. We don't care if they're collecting it at the time they're grinding the rotors themselves, but when they're not using the machine, it should be kept in a closed container that's labeled. They've made a hazardous waste determination. They've determined it's hazardous and needs to have a hazardous waste label as well. On the right is an example of a key glass cabinet. So what they use this for is they put some type of part in there that they either need to clean or to get any type of coating off of it. So we'll put it in this cabinet and blast it with either steel beads or plastic beads. Um, so when in the, in the course of that process, they are chipping off some parts of the metal piece itself or the coatings themselves may be have heavy metals. So they would need to make a hazardous waste determination on the actual key glass material media before disposing it. So they need to make a hazardous waste, waste determination as well. It's in, in process equipment so they can keep on using it. It's not determined to be a waste until they decide that the key glass media is no longer effective. Any questions about that? Use it indefinitely. So the gener it's up to the generator to make that determination of it being a waste. So if it's unusable, then it's a waste. But if you guys can, if you continue using it, yep, same thing as a parts washer. So you would use a parts washer and continue until the, the parts washer solution doesn't do its job anymore, then it's a waste. And then you need to make a switch determination after that. So just like that four prong question, you're still using it. So 
Is it a waste? Still being used for its intended purpose. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, you can't. No, no, you got to be using it there. You can't. I mean, it's if it's still being used and can be used for its intended purposes, then it's not a waste. Um, what we don't want to start seeing is, well, we can't use it, but they can use it over there. Because now you're getting chemicals. Yeah, you. Shoka? Yeah. We'll get into that some more. Okay. The, pro the, the problem you're going to start getting into, and this is where the retail stores kind of got in trouble at the beginning, too, is, well, we're not going to use it here, but we're going to give it to this facility over here, which is going to use it. Well, if you dump it over there and half of the stuff they use, the other half is just waste, you've now just kind of got rid of your waste at a non permitted facility. So now you're opening yourself up for disposing of hazardous waste to leave. So a lot of the retail stores at the beginning were doing this were donating to third parties, to nonprofits. Well, you're donating stuff. One, you can't use it. It wasn't going to be used for its intended purpose anyways. And then two, now you've just taken hazardous waste possibly and given it to someone else which is not permitted to accept the hazardous waste. So if you start doing that practice you're going to kind of open yourself up some some issues. Yeah, that's one of those one of those things you're gonna have to be a little careful with because it's happened before where you know you don't want to start passing off your waste thinking that, yeah, they're going to use it down the road, but if you did give it to them, they don't use it at all, and now it's a hazardous waste, why didn't you make that waste determination back at your school? You just pass that, that waste, determination, waste determination down the road. You just kind of kick the bucket down the can down the road. So when you start doing that, you, you really have to be careful that you're not getting rid of hazardous waste. Yeah, it's a good idea to make sure that it's still usable product and be 100% sure that it is usable. <laughs> no, but you might, I mean. Yeah, that's uh, it, it's it's been out there. It's happened. No, it's happened. It's happened. But that's yeah. Correct. I mean, you want to keep logs, and and that there is an open dialogue that you will be using it and all that. I mean, it, it's just record keeping. I mean, how much you sent over to this other school, they agreed, yeah, we're going to use it all. Um, so, yeah, just keep logs. I mean, it's something where it's communication logs. It's not a waste until you claim it's a waste. Um, what we don't want to see is you think they're going to use it all. There's no upward dialogue. There's no record keeping on that. You give it to them, and it now has, they didn't use it. They just are going to get rid of it. They, it's, it's, they just deemed it's a waste. It's, it's happened in the retail business, so it's one of those things, you, it's a, a slippery slope that if you want to do that, then, you know, there may be consequences. Um, if you don't want to do it, then handle the waste at your school or at the point of generation. Any other questions? All right. So some issues we've run across in industrial arts, metal shops, auto shops. Uh, unsecured cylinders uh, on the right, buckets open, um, say aerosol cans floating on top, which is closed containers, potentially mismanaging aerosol cans, universal waste, bottom left, parts washer, some spillage, obvious spillage on the bottom, um, are they cleaning up spills promptly, how are they managing the spills, and lead acid batteries are also being We 
wood shop, carpentry, house and school handling paint, stains, adhesives, compressed gases. In this particular school where this photo was taken, a teacher would spray stains on sheds that they're building or guitars. What he was doing with, his, with the paints themselves to empty out the canisters and spray it directly on sawdust for the purposes of getting rid of that paint. So has he made a waste determination on the stains that he's using? Um, maybe not for water-based stuff, but for stains that are oil-based. There's potential for you know, a legal treatment at that point. So the reason he was spraying the sawdust was to evaporate the, the vapors and then he would use it either as ground cover instead of for the rest of the school or dispose of the trash. So you can ask questions, lots of questions. Yes. Questions about pain care? We do have a slide coming up talking about pain care. Yeah. Uh, middle picture, for example, some stains that they're using. And on our right, this is an interesting situation. They actually fabricate their own paint booth. It's hard to see, it's behind this forklift. Um, they make guitars and they stain them, and so they sell them, and they get the donated profits for the school to do other projects. They're using a box fan back here, a regular box fan, household box fan, and they put a filter on the front of it to capture any overspray. So potentially they are generating a hazardous waste, they need to make a waste determination on that filter itself. So uncommon stuff you run across, every school is handled differently, teachers come up with their own creative solutions on how to handle hazardous waste potentially. So the take home message is, ask a lot of questions. Potentially, yes, they may need an air quality permit. Yes sir. Yeah, yeah, we have. We've seen rags as well being used to apply stains, and same thing. They need to make a waste determination on that as well. Um, some miscellaneous classes that we don't have time to cover in detail, but bike shops, a lot of bike shops are using uh, disc brakes now. They're using hydraulic oils, so if they're draining any hydro hydraulic oils from lines, they may be generating hazardous waste as well. Uh, medical dental, amalgam waste with mercury, medical oxygens, nitrous oxides, sterilizing solutions like glutaraldehyde or OPA. Cosmetology generates potentially hazardous waste. And a lot of our schools, a lot of our, most of our presentations cater towards schools, but we also cover a lot of vocational things as well, cosmetology schools or college campuses and that may have these materials. Engineering, compressed gases, lubricants. Yeah, at some of the colleges like Sac State that we inspect, they bank, they made a race car so engineering was building race cars, so they had fuels, they had oils, they had compressed gases, so um, some of the newer classes are construction, they're making tough sheds. Um, so physical, physical education, um, one of the things that you're gonna see in the physical education department would be pools. Um, do they have reportable quantities of pool chemicals, muriatic acid, sodium hypochlorite, or do they have an outside source come in and just maintain the pool? So no chemicals are stored on site, but they have a company or maintenance people come back from the corp yard and actually do the stuff, remove the chemicals so nothing is stored on site. Um, the next thing you're gonna look at, incompatible, incompatibility issues. Um, a lot of times we'll find muriatic acid and sodium hypochlorite stored together. Potentially they may be gonna mix. So if these mix, we're gonna have chlorine gas, public safety. So take a look at the storage so here's a uh, pool at one of the schools that we've visited. Um, you see the, the nice poly drums out there of storage. They're working. This one had um, acid stored out in a fiber drum out on one of the few days it rains in Sacramento. Um, what you don't see right outside here was a little storm drain. So we have a poly drum that's starting to get compromised with acid in it. It's raining with a storm drain nearby. So maybe this should be stored inside maybe in a container, uh, like a Rubbermaid container, away from the elements. Also, physical, physical education, you have the fields, you have the gymnasiums. Um, with a lot of the fields, now they're becoming synthetic, so we're gonna start seeing a lot less of this, but you have the herbicides, the fertilizers, the marking paint, are they storing that in reportable quantities? Along with the field maintenance, you might find some small engine equipment, blowers, lawnmowers, how do they manage that? Filters, oil gasoline. Um, 
for the gyms, how are they managing their light bulbs? The metal halide bulbs are common for gymnasiums. Are they managing with universal waste? Are they going out just as regular garbage? They do contain a little bit of mercury. Um, so ask what they're doing with that. So a lot of the places that we found the, the marking paint, they are storing them in five gallon buckets. Um, they're usually a lot more than 55 gallons on site. Um, even with the synthetic fields, we've been finding marking paint above reportable quantities. Um, you also have pallets of fertilizer and then small equipment. Custodial prep areas. Um, what you'll find in the custodial areas usually is fluorescent bulbs, hopefully managed as universal waste and not in a garbage can. Um, one of the things you might find, they're kind of getting away from it, but look at the snack bars, is the CO2. Um, it's not going to be in reportable quantities, probably, because I don't really think they're going to store 6,000 cubic feet of this, but just take a look. Um, are they chained? What's going on? And then also cleaners and degreasers. Um, what do they have? Is it in reportable quantities? Make sure the containers aren't compromised, leaking. Student government. Um, they do have some small amount of paints in there. Painting signs for pep rallies, for homecoming, dances. They also have helium storage. Usually below the reportable quantities of 1,000 cubic feet, but take a look how they're storing it. Is it chained up? Is it secured? Some of the larger high schools and definitely the colleges, look for backup generators. Um, they usually are using the diesel fuel as a fuel source, or in certain cases, um, propane tanks. Um, so when we inspected Sac State originally, they didn't mark any of their backup generators down. Every building had a backup generator with one of these on it. And not listed in their business plan, not on the site map. The guy didn't even know about it. Um, so we went around and found probably about 20 propane tanks that weren't listed. Other places you're going to look is either central plants or chiller and boiler rooms. What they have is water treatment chemicals, corrosion inhibitors, um, biocides, bacteria levels in check. You're also going to find lubricating oils. I mean, there's engine parts in there, so they're going to have engine oils, lubricating oils. You might see some of the waste there. So this is waste oil from a central plant at a university, but they also have some water treatment chemicals in there. Some oddball stuff that you might see that we see in our rural schools is water treatment for drinking. Um, some places might have reportable quantities of sodium hypochlorite. They might just be treating their water before they allow to drink it. You might have other ones where they might have arsenic in their well water. And we have one where they have arsenic in their well water. They might do a treatment process. Well, the sludge and the filter media, that treatment process, have they done a waste determination? Um, I know not a school, but another company that does this type of treatment, their sludge came back as hazardous waste. It failed the STLC. They mismanaged it. They thought it was non-hazardous. They got rid of it as non-hazardous waste. And once we started looking at the analytical, it actually failed the STLC and as hazardous waste. So take a look. If they're doing any type of water treatment, removing heavy, heavy metals out of their well water, take a look at, one, how what's the filter media? You know, When it's a waste, is it a hazardous waste? And then another one is they're going to be cleaning these water treatment units, usually with a third-party contractor. Ask them about that. Um, you probably won't see them. Um, they only come out there for about a week or so, but they're cleaning it with hydrogen peroxide, sodium hydroxide, generating a wastewater. What do they do with that? The company that um, was treating their arsenic last time, they did have a third-party contractor come out that was maintaining their water treatment unit and that wastewater that was coming off had a pH of 1.7. So just ask those questions. If they're, if they're treating their well water, ask just general questions. How do, they, how do they maintain it? Have you done a waste termination on the filter media? A lot of schools rent out their space for church organizations or other organizations that like to use it on the weekend. See what they're storing on site. A lot of times these places have four, Sea containers that they do their own storage. Are they storing hazardous materials in there? Are they storing compressed gases? So just ask those questions, look around. If you see a bunch of sea containers, just ask what's in it. Ask them to open it. So paint care. Um, some of the schools that we have been to are disposing some of their paints at, through paint care. Um, paint care only takes architectural paints, so house, building paints, primers, stains, and sealers. 
a lot of the maintenance people have been using this program. Um, there's 696 drop-off sites in California. It was started in 2012, and like it's funded by all the paint you buy. So there's a fee to the paint we buy that funds this program. It won't accept aerosol cans, solvents, arts and paints, or paints and specialty coatings. Um, LQGs can drop off their latex paint there. Um, and then at the end of our presentation, it's also up on the, the website, we do have a resource, a um, few resources pages with all the links to paint care and some other things that we're going to be talking about so you can take it back to work list. All right, this is the bulk of our presentation. Sciences, fun stuff. Uh, for biology, the major waste stream that they're generating are spent se specimens that have been dissected. Uh, typically, they use some type of uh, preservative, formalin, methyl alcohol, glyraldehyde, propylene glycol. Um, most schools are managing that as hazardous waste, the specimens themselves, and the solutions that they're kept in, formaldehyde being the big one. Um, formaldehyde and formalin are actually synonymous, really. Uh, formalin just has some methyl alcohol added to it, added to the formaldehyde. So question to ask is if the facility does not manage their spent specimens, does not manage their specimens, how are they managing it? Um, typically hazardous waste, but we have on occasion run across schools that are just throwing them in the trash. So they may be using some type of different preservative like methyl alcohol, but same deal like Hammerin's point across is hazardous waste determination has that waste determination been made. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Directly into the sink. So first we look at the SDS for formaldehyde specifically. It is listed as a presumed hazardous waste in Appendix 10 of Title 22 um, for ignitability and toxicity. Also, manufacturer testing has shown that the formaldehyde itself has come back as hazardous waste failing a fish kill test, pretty much. So the violation I typically write up if I would see something like that is a hazardous waste determination. Unless you're gonna take a sample and, and test for that, and show that it's toxic. The next best thing is hazardous waste determination and have them describe why they know it's not hazardous waste. Because at the point of generation is that specimen is being used to dissect. Once you're done with it, that is the point of generation, not after you wash it all off. And say it's yeah, so hazardous. prior to any type of treatment, treatment, they would need to make a waste determination. Yes, sir. Yeah, so they could handle the actual specimen itself. It's formaldehyde specifically as medical waste as well. So that's a possibility. Is there another question on this? Yep. So I'll last example of uh, how it's packaged. So in this case, sheep rain. This one's using formalin and methyl alcohol as a preservative. On the right, it's interesting, this container was actually in a classroom that was occupied at the time. Um, they are hurting for space at school, so sometimes they'll keep hazardous, hazardous waste containers with the students in the school itself. And so it's a safety issue. It's not something that is under our authority as group inspectors, but it's a consideration I need to make as a school administrator to keep that stuff away. Um, is there? Yes, sir. Yeah, we have something in the resources page for that as well, so you guys can refer back to that. Um, anyone from Santa Clara County in the audience? Great. So we actually got this from one of your guidance documents on schools. Uh, this is the Ethidium bromide and gel, electro gel electrophoresis experiments. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what gel electrophoresis is, they, it's an experiment using biology where they're, they put a DNA sample and 
typically all migrate during an electrical current, and they look at the banding to determine fragment length. Um, so the DNA itself, the sample, it's clear. So what they do is they add a fluorescent dye to it to see how far it's migrated. The fluorescent dye that's typically used is lithium bromide. Uh, it's highly toxic, mentioned in the mutagen as well. So how are these electrophoretic wastes being managed? Um, like I said, they're and the SDSs themselves, they show them as mutagenic, so they are toxic. Um, the class we inspected, the teacher said that they were handling it as a biohazard and that was kept in a different classroom. However, when looking at the other classroom, there was no evidence of the container for that hazardous waste. So, and there was no, also no uh, hazardous waste manifest showing and documenting that those are being managed as hazardous waste either. We think potentially it's either going in the trash or it's being managed differently. Picture on the left is an example of the ethidium bromide. What they do is they attach it to the bottom of the actual gel itself, and then the gel sucks up the ethidium bromide to mark any of the DNA fragments. And so once you put it under a UV light, you can see how far the fragments have migrated. Question. Autoclaving is not one way to manage it. You would be treating a hazardous waste if you had made that determination already. Um, so it would require a treatment permit. Um, typically, you would, you would send it off as hazardous waste and have a TSDF manage it there. Yes. This isn't one of the waste streams that would be covered in the mineral waste. That I know of, at least. Unless someone else has any experience with it. All right, chemistry. So teachers typically keep their chemicals and reagents for a long period of time, uh, decades in some cases. So are the chemical reagents still usable? Do they have any experiments that would require them to use those reagents that they're keeping? Over time, they have a shelf life, a definitive shelf life, and they can be chemically unstable at that point. Um, and they may not even be usable for any experiments in the future. So a good thing for them, for teachers to do in the chemistry lab is to purge any chemicals on occasion, make a waste determination on any waste that are being stored there. Are the reagents being stored properly? A lot of issues we see are chemicals not being kept in closed containers, not being labeled properly, incompatibles aren't being kept separate. Uh, so same thing, hazardous waste determination is the chemical listed, is it characteristic, is it ignitable, toxic? Also, how are any metal bearing wastes being managed? A lot of facilities, a lot of schools generate metal bearing waste and it's a good question to ask is if it's metal bearing, how are they managing it? Are they doing any type of bench top treatment? Are they mitigating the metals that are in there? The one thing about getting rid of your reagents is um, we had a, when we were inspecting one of the universities in Sacramento, um, one of the stories the chemistry department told us is they had a professor that like to stockpile his reagents and his chemicals under his sink. Well, they got so bad and started crystallizing that instead of calling a licensed waste hauler, they ended up having to get the bomb squad in there and actually get those chemicals out of there. So if you're not going to be using them anymore, and if the, the school or the university is not going to be using them anymore, it's probably a good idea just to get rid of them um, and not go through the idea of having a bomb squad them out to put something that shock sensitive. Yeah, you see a lot of chemistry labs just hoarding chemicals. You see fume hoods typically just massive amounts of different chemicals, not some, most not labeled, kept in not, not a closed container and not labeled as well. Question. Mm -hmm. So episodic generation, LPG, right? That's something, I mean, kind of towards the end and kind of hitting that is when you do get compliance programs, start doing some forward thinking and some planning. So if you know there's some some, some chemicals or some experiments that you're going to be doing, plan, try to plan ahead so that potentially you don't have one just giant cleanup at the end of the year where you're becoming an episodic LPG. You can 
spacing over some time and stuff like that. So part of the compliance program is forward thinking. What are we going to be doing? Can we, can we clean this out? Did set up different times so that we kind of can stay under that that LQG status and stay under SQG status. So um, especially with high schools too for budgeting, just what kind of experiments are we going to be running? My understanding. It's, that's something you're going to want to talk to your local Koopa. Um, DTSC has a pretty strict definition of LQG. It's, you need to have that additional training and everything held to the LQG standard for that period of time at least that you're managing the waste. But like Robert's saying, I would speak to the locals first and see what their opinion is. Yes, sir. Yeah, not not much. <laughs> so, question is: Are they being properly trained on management of chemicals? Do they have any written, written procedures to follow? So, one of the one of the things we run across is that they don't get much training. So, it's really left up to the teachers to come up with their own creative solutions on how to handle hazardous waste. Yes, it's a, it, it is a requirement. Yes, that they receive the training on proper hazardous waste management. But, like I said, that's not in the case for a lot of high schools that we run across. So that's one of the, definitely one of the high points. Uh, one of the points we want to get across is that training needs to be done. And another issue is in the second point here, chemical reagents that are purchased through Ward Science or Flynn Scientific is that they publish their own disposal methods and a lot of teachers are following these methods to a T. Uh, and typically it's written for federals federal standard, RICRA standard. Um, granted, they do, in the manuals, they talk about making sure that it's applicable to the locals as well, um, that they're following the local rules, but that's probably not the case. Um, so it could lead them down the path of illegally treating hazardous waste or illegally discharging into the sewer system as well. So we had this slide earlier on left. This is actually a metal bearing waste and the teacher, that was a good idea to treat it himself. So it's a copper waste. What he was doing, he was adding regular nails to it to precipitate out the copper. So that is a treatment activity to get the copper out so they can discharge the solution to the sewer potentially. Um, so it's, it's very common to see unlabeled containers with some weird stuff in it. And I'm not a chemist, Robert's not a chemist. Teachers kind of know what's going on, but they don't know the actual hazardous waste rules. So when you see random things like this, it's a good, question, good time to ask them some hard questions. On the right is the heavy metal waste. Uh, is that properly labeled? No. It says heavy metal waste, so it identifies what the contents are and the potential hazards of it, lead, barium. Um, but it's not hazardous waste label, and we'll get into more with hazardous waste labeling later in the presentation. On the left is a fume hood. You can see quite a bit of crystallization here. So there's issues with potential incompatibility. Um, what, what are those crystals? Is it now shock sensitive? Um, there's definitely a potential for it to mix with additional reagents. So it's something to ask. On the right, like I said, fume hoods. A lot of stuff is being kept in there. A lot of things that aren't labeled, not kept in closed containers unidentifiable at this point. All right, bench top treatment. So this is applicable to K through 12, college campuses, but what it does, it allows schools to treat hazardous wastes if they follow certain rules. Uh, it's only applicable to waste that are generated in the laboratory, um, either near or at the point of generation there are economic and safety benefits to it if it's being done right. The economic benefit it, is it being um, treated at the time and that it doesn't need to be disposed of as hazardous waste through a licensed waste hauler. They can actually mitigate the risks there. 
uh, safety benefit, same thing. They can mitigate the actual risks at the lab instead of having it just stored at the school for an indefinite amount of time until a hazardous waste hauler comes to pick it up. Uh, so we're gonna go over what the requirements are, are of benchtop treatment. One is that it needs to be following procedures recommended by NRC, National Research Council, or some, some similar journal that's peer reviewed. Um, so they can't just look at the Flynn Scientific Manual and say that's good. It has to be actually from the NRC or a journal of, uh, some, that, that, that's very similar to it. Notification isn't required to the PUPA, um, but they are required to keep some documentation for inspection. One being that the written procedures and treatment processes be kept on site. Uh, treatment log showing what chemicals are being treated and a list of personnel um, that are authorized to perform the treatment itself. Um, they need to have knowledge of the waste being treated, have received hazardous waste training, and how to effectively re respond to emergency situations. Students should be should not be doing this. I would, yeah, recommend the teachers or someone that has knowledge and know-how in this process. No, notification is not required. They just need to be doing it right. So when the inspector does come, they would, they'll be asking these questions of what they have on site, the training requirements, the treatment logs, that type of deal. Yes, sir. Yeah, there are volume limits. Next slide, we're going to talk about some of the volume limits. So like I said, hazardous waste must be treated near a location that was generated and within 10 days of generating that hazardous waste. Uh, training records on hazardous waste treatment and personnel that are authorized to do the treatment have to be maintained for a minimum of three years. And the residuals and effluent that are potentially going to be discharged to the sewer system um, must be managed in accordance with local law. So it's probably a great idea to notify POTW that's going to be going to to get their okay to discharge those effluents. Yes. My understanding is that it started. I'm, I'm not sure if complete. I would think it's something as simple as like an acid-based neutralization, something common like that. So I don't. I look the NRC document that talks about the procedures on how to do it. It's 10 page, it's only 10 pages of like a 200 page manual. And I don't remember anything that required a longer process other than like immediate treatment at that point to neutralize, to mitigate the hazard. So I don't think so, but from my understanding, it started within that 10 days. Yes, um, yeah, the amount that we were talking about it is five gallons. Um, the amount of hazardous waste treated in a single batch can't exceed five gallons or 18 kilograms, whatever is the smallest quantity. So that's the amount that you can do bench top treatment. Yeah, at one time. That's correct. Potentially, yes. It needs to follow the guidelines that are listed in NRC or, like I said, a peer reviewed scientific journal. So as long as you're following those guidelines specifically, then five gallons at a time. Yes, Dennis? There's another question, yes. Yeah, it applies to schools. It does apply to schools and I know UCLA and Cal, they have their benchtop treatment procedures listed on their websites and they have the training and everything to be done. And like I said on the website, they have it listed out what the proper procedures are, who's authorized to do that treatment. So yes, it is applicable to schools as well, not just the biotech industry or, or clinical labs. Um, <laughs> I 
would say I wouldn't encourage that, but if the teacher is aware of it and they know what's going on, then I mean, what you're going to want to look is for the training. I mean, does the teacher know what they're doing? Is it part of the instruction? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's providing instruction. Um, um, yeah, it's part of the lesson. And so, um, but what you want to look to is the training, right? This is not something that's the teacher just kind of going off on their own. He's actually following the procedure that he's supposed to be doing, but it's part of the lesson. This is all schools, colleges, campuses as well. It may not be, but it is, it is an option. It doesn't exclude K through 12. Any, any facility that has in a laboratory setting can use this as well. But you, you're probably right, the college campuses will be using this more often. Maybe it's not a good idea, but that's, it's an option if the school administrator wanted to manage it this way. It's out there. We figure we share that with even K through twelve schools. Acid base is a big part of it. There are other ones I can't think of off the top of my head, but no, that's not an authorized treatment method on there. I don't think. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> like I said. The document is pretty in practices in the laboratory handling and disposal of chemicals. It's like a 1995 document. Like I said, it's a 200 page manual on like safety, training, laboratory safety and everything, but it does have the 10 pages that talks about treatment, authorized treatment procedures. And it's in the resources page as well, if you guys want to reference that the actual document. Yes, sir. Yeah, you mentioned that earlier as well. Right, another after bench top treatment, we're talking about acid neutralization tanks. Okay. So acid neutralization tanks, what they're used for is neutralizing weak acids typically. We see them at school campuses. It's kind of hit or miss. Some schools have them, some don't in Sacramento County. Uh, what it's used for is uh, to treat the, the acids that are going down the drain and they may have neutralization tanks that all the, the sinks are plumbed to in the science wing. Um, it's hit or miss in that also in that the teachers and school administrators may not know it exists. So when we're doing our walkthroughs of schools now, we always make sure to ask the questions and take a quick walk around the actual science wing itself to look for any unmarked manholes just to get an idea if, it, if it's there or not. Um, the reason for the, the neutralization tanks to be installed, we did some research on this and we contacted the Division of State Architect under Department of General Services for the state, also the Office of Public School Construction. We tried to find out if there's some type of building code requirement for the tanks to be installed. We didn't. So the only thing they pointed to was the plumbing code, which is a very small generic section listed. Uh, title 24, section 1009, about interceptors and that they need to be installed in the case any corrosives or ignitables or toxics are being sent down the drain. They need to have some type of way to mitigate it and neutralize it before it gets into the sewer system. So I think we found is that they're installed to protect the sewer lines themselves from corrosion potentially, but nothing in the building code that requires new schools or schools that are being remodeled to have them installed. Unless anyone else has had any experience with acid neutralization and knows anything more. This, we have some good pictures to show you. This is not, not bad at all. This is actually an underground below grade tank. Usually about 50 gallons total, but we'll, we'll get to some pictures. Maintenance, right? Yeah. yeah, to maintain them. The limestone chips, yeah. Yeah, 
yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. It just came on our radar maybe three, four months ago that these exist. So we're still doing some digging and trying to understand what they're for, who's requiring them. Um, but we have some some photos as well that kind of go over the process. There may be some, yeah. There may be some issues with the illegal treatment. And if it's hazardous waste below grade, it may need monitoring and, and leak detection as well. But this is what we're going to go over right now. So the way they work is that they use limestone chips to neutralize acids, uh, probably weaker acids, not stronger acids, um, prior to being discharged to the sewer system, just like I said, to protect the sewer itself. Um, if it's below grade and it contains a hazardous waste, it may be regulated as a UST. So there's that issue with it in that it may fa fall under UST regulations. Um, if it's a haz at hazardous waste la levels, like in below 2 or greater than 12.5, that's going into that tank itself. They may be conducting unauthorized treatment at that point, or hazardous waste treatment. And another issue, it's kind of a psychological thing, but it may give teachers false assumption that these tanks will treat anything and everything. It is an acid neutralization tank, not like a magical proof your hazardous waste are now non-hazardous tank. So it does nothing for metal bearing wastes or ignitables or high pH stuff. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So the way, oh, question? Nothing in Sac County. Uh, not in Sac County, but as soon as you ask that, a bunch of hands bumped up. So, but potentially, <laughs> so maybe a good idea for these schools to get away from them, just to. Not Has anybody have that else issue. seen these handled as USTs? Yeah. Sure. Go ahead, sir. go through it a little bit more, but I mean, the concept of these things sounds simple, but when you start talking to personnel, they have no idea what this is, and they just pour everything down. There's heavy metals going down. There's acids below two going down. They're not maintained, so the lime chips are not working anymore, so now you pretty much have an underground hazardous waste tank. Yeah, so the way the, um, the acid neutralization tank works is you get um, some, there's plumped to the sinks themselves, so whatever's going down mixes with the limestone chips here. The limestone chips degrade over time to create CO2 plus salts. So they only have a certain shelf, shelf life. Um, they can only last a certain time, but what we've been seeing is that these haven't been maintained since being installed. So it's usually it's a sludge, just sludge and a giant mixing tank at that point. It's not really doing anything. Um, Discharges in the pH monitors right here that monitors the pH of the effluent prior to going to the sewer system. And this is this photo right here is just an example that is below grain. There's typically a manhole cover that just sees the top of this tank. Yes, sir. We've seen 30 to 50 gallons somewhere in that range. It's interesting because we we at doing the research we asked ours and we asked our locals and they said they're not looking at them. They're not so. even looking at it. Okay. Well, yeah, teachers. I mean, it's fine if they're neutralizing weak acids um, below two, but teachers don't know what the tank's for. They don't know it exists. So 
there's just that potential for them to be treating hazardous waste at that point. I mean, we talked about the one that we were looking at and then also we were identified of the silver tank that they were pouring the silver waste. So the, the faculty just doesn't know. And that's part of the education process that we were telling them. So. Okay, so we don't have much time, so we're going to skip some slides to get to some of the different topics. That's, that's neutralization tanks, and it's, I think it described it enough. But this is an example of an acid neutralization tank and the manhole and the access. So you can see the limestone chips down here. It's below grade typically. Um, so a common thing we run across are schools wanting to collect hazardous waste from their different schools and bring it back to a corporation yard. Corporation yards where they usually keep all their construction materials or fleet vehicles and everything. They want to go to different schools, pick it up, and then bring it back to this one centralized location. So they take it from the courtyard, go to school A, B, C, and then bring it right back. Is this allowed under remote consolidation? No, it is not. Remote consolidation is only for facilities that are remotely consolidating hazardous waste from facilities that aren't staffed or occupied. Schools are staffed and occupied almost year round, so that would not work. The provision is for cell tower sites or utility companies typically. Even though remote consolidation, question? Okay, perfect. Nice. That's, that's good to know. That's good to know. Breaking news, that's right. There you go. Um, even though they can't do, gotcha. Yes, sir. Is it usable or not? Okay, that's fine. It's a correct. If it's not a waste, it's a product at the point, you can transport it. It's, there's no issues with hazardous waste regulations. They don't kick in at all. You're, you're talking about materials. You're not talking yeah, about it, waste. It doesn't fall. This is about waste. So you're talking about a material, so it's not a waste yet. So this doesn't even apply. So with materials, you're just, as long as you're with DOT regulations and transporting it, you're fine. Once you call it a waste, this is when this kicks in. That you talk about licensed waste haulers. This is just about waste. Okay, so even though remote consolidation isn't allowed, there is a provision under tier permitting permit by rule, uh, like I alluded to earlier. Showcaf schools hazardous waste collection consolidation and accumulation facility. Um, so it is applicable only for K through 12 schools. It would not be applicable campuses and it's under PBR like I said. So I'm trying to rush we only have 10 minutes left. No one in Sacramento County has notified us that they want to use this provision but but we've been part of hazardous waste tag groups where we know other counties have actually been doing this. So if you guys if any other counties out there have experience with this, does anyone have any experience? Right. Contra Costa, Santa Clara was another one that told us about this. Um, so we're just, I mean, we've done enough, gone through and kind of researched it, so we're throwing it out there. But yeah, if you guys have done this or find other acid neutrals, take an acid neutralization tank, just speak up. Yeah, let us know. Uh, so the benefits of using this provision, decreased risk of student exposure, you're getting rid of the hazardous waste, you're not keeping it at the school itself and sent, bring it to a centralized location so it's away from students cost savings and that you're not disposing of smaller containers of hazardous waste at that point. You're consolidating at one location, which decreases the fees typically for hazardous waste hauler. And space savings, schools are crunched for space. And so they, in getting rid of the hazardous waste from that location, they're able to open up more space for other materials. Drawback, additional training, uh, increased liability of actually transporting the hazardous waste on roadways and storing it somewhere else, and the additional notification under PBR and you guys have dealt with PBR there's a lot of things that go into it so it's not an easy process to go under show the show gaff so there's 
more regulations kick in. Uh, so, so the requirements are notification. You need to have a detailed description of how the waste is managed, both at the school and the SHOCAF. Uh, certification financial responsibility. So you need to have a closure plan in place uh, even prior to, to opening that facility, the SHOCAF, showing that you have the funds necessary to close the facility. Yes. Potentially, yeah. The sh yes, there is that potential, yes. There would be a generator at that point. <clears throat> it could be on a campus. There's no restrictions on that. So it doesn't have to be a corp yard. They can either find a, maybe a larger high school campus or a different facility. Yes. There are limits as far as how much you can transport. I'm not sure if that falls under the DT. Gonna, it'll DOTs. fall under DTSC. So um, I don't have the amount there off that. You can, but you have to follow, unless you get, a lot of times with remote site consolidations, the utilities will get actually a variance from DTSC where they can transport more waste than is authorized. But you have to follow transportation laws when you're doing this on transporting that. You just can't start throwing 55 gallon drums in the back of the pickup. Driving it from one school to the corp yard. Yeah, now your that pickup truck is technically acting as a licensed waste hauler, um, unless you have the variance and you're allowed to do that. Um, so yeah, you have to stay below the. Uh, the there amounts. are volume limits that are listed under this provision under PBR. So if you look it up, you'll see all the volume limits of how much you can transport at one time. And there's also limits for how much waste the show can. All right, some additional requirements. Phase one, environmental site assessments required within one year. Uh, the maintaining hazardous waste inventory, operating log, describing how, what wastes are coming in, how much is coming in, the show calf. Uh, the contributing schools must be CSQGs. So if they are above that 27 gallons a month and they're an SQG, they can't contribute their waste to the show calf. Um, like I said, there's volume limits on transportation and storage. Does anyone want, want any figures as far as how much? 135 gallons uh, per transport is what I've seen. Um, and it looks like container sizes can't be more than five gallons as well. So you can have up to 135 gallons, but each container size must be five gallons or less. because they do, yeah, we don't have handouts because they are going paperless. But if you log on, we updated, it was Friday morning, we updated our PowerPoint and at the end, I think we have three or four pages of resources. So websites, links, um, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, everything's on there. So now we're gonna go through what to, what to expect during an inspection. Um, Coop inspectors will be coming out doing a walkthrough. What we're going to look at is how you manage your hazardous waste and containers, um, tanks, labeling standards for hazmat, haz waste, emergency response equipment, uh, spill management. And one thing we like to do on our inspections is take a lot more photos. It, you know, helps with return to compliance photos. This is what it looked like during the inspection. This is what it looked like after the inspection. So you'll see here, we have a discharge fire extinguisher during one of our inspections. Um, also. Decon stations, probably not the best spot for recycling. So during the inspection, what you're gonna do is you're gonna do a hazardous materials business plan review. Um, usually we do that back at the office and then what we'll do is look at what they have on site to see do they have everything listed, is everything in the site map, is the names and the emergency response plan correct. You're gonna look for training records for the teachers and any faculty members that are associated with the hazmat has waste. Yes. We have asked that question because that's a question that we brought up in our own department. They're handling the hazardous materials. Not 100% sure, but I'm thinking that OSHA looks at them. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the answer. If, 
They're not employees. Okay. They're players. They're players, but, you know, it's, yeah. The, t- the teacher, the faculty members, they're the ones that are the employees to the school district. Um, we've asked that same question, though, in our staff meetings, because it's a lot of the students, though, are the ones handling the chemicals. Um, hazardous waste disposal documentation. Um, look for receipts. Do they have it? Have they maintained it for three years? And any waste determinations, analytical. So the first one, um, broken glass. This is contaminated chemistry glass. They ship it off on a hazardous waste manifest. It shouldn't be labeled just with a eight and a half by 11 piece of paper saying broken glass. Um, Also another one for disposal specimens and waste oil. So what's supposed to be on a hazardous waste label? It's supposed to say hazardous waste. It's supposed to have the generator's name, address, the contents, physical state, the hazards associated. Is it flammable, toxic, corrosive? And also the accumulation start date. So how about the hazardous materials that you find on labels? You look and do an acid corrosive thing, you might find an acid thing that's not labeled. Well, they have to label this within 10 days or it becomes a waste. Damaged containers also. If you find some damaged containers, they need to be recontainer, put in a suitable container that's not damaged or deteriorating. Otherwise, it's considered a hazardous waste. The chemistry department is a big culprit in this. If you go look in there, definitely also look under the sinks. Um, That's where all the professors usually keep all their stuff. But yeah, you'll find crystallized containers. You'll find containers with no labels on them. I found incompatibles in the same bin together. So, I mean, you really find a lot of things in the chemistry departments. Open hazardous waste containers needs to be kept closed if not adding or removing waste. Hazardous waste training, hazmat training. So initial and annual training records must be kept for three years for HASCOM through Title 19 and Health and Safety Code. This is for the Hazardous Materials Business Plan Program. For hazardous waste, conditionally exempt in small quantity generators. Hazardous, the training, there's no real detail. It's just they need to know how to handle and manage hazardous waste correctly. There's no training records, even though we like to see them, but there's nothing saying you have to keep training records for three years. As a large quantity generator, that's different. It has to be detailed, what the training covers, what employees are trained, how long you keep the records for. So is the school or is the corporate yard conditionally exempt, small quantity or LPG? Some of the training items that we have seen is EPA's chemical management resource guide for school administrators. We have a link in our resource page. Also the Science Safety Handbook for California Public Schools. And then in Sacramento County, we actually have made a guideline for hazardous waste hauls handled, hazardous waste generators. It goes through everything about labeling, manifesting. Um, all these are in our resources side. So the, as Daniel was saying, the most common violation we find, not performing waste termination. We go through these schools and laboratory chemicals are being poured down the drain. The teachers are very upfront about it. They, they, they don't know they're doing anything wrong, so they're usually telling us. Um, paint waste, metal grindings, photography, ceramics. So when you take a look at a sea container and you find it completely full of unused chemicals, they're not gonna use these anymore. Have they done a waste determination? Are they storing them, accumulating them as hazardous waste? You find unlabeled 55 gallon drums in shops. Nobody knows what it is. Hazardous materials business plan, have they reported their hazardous waste or hazardous materials? Is it above 55 gallons, 500 pounds, 200 cubic feet? Have they filled out completely a site map showing where everything is? Record keeping, not keeping records or not having records available during an inspection. That's a common one. Usually when we ask for 
manifest or churning records, they don't have them. Um, and no hazardous waste cons consolidation at the corp yard. This is one that we've been seeing a lot with school districts. They'll go around with pickup trucks, pick up all the waste, bring it right back to the corp yard, and now we have a large waste pile at the corp yard. And incompatibles. This one is really about student safety and safety of the employees. You don't want to be mixing some chemicals that, in this case, hydrogen cyanide, you wouldn't want this to happen. So real quick, um, this is one of our inspection photos, but a mock inspection. Just looking at this photo of a fume hood of a high school, any violations, potential violations that we see? What's not a violation? Yeah, right? what is not a violation? So not sure about the labeling here, but are these waste streams? You have open containers. Is there any compatibility issue? We have some spillage down here. Um, this is your typical fume hood that we go to a high school and see. So then you go into industrial arts, auto shop, any violations? I mean, the floating air, oops. The floating aerosol can, open containers. We got the filter just sitting here. Um, there is a little bit of fluid in this trough, so. Um, these are your typical inspection photos. So as we said earlier, compliance programs will help the schools not pay the large fines out of their budgets, but you know, kind of looking forward, that's what we're hoping these school districts will look for is what kind of experiments are you gonna do? What kind of waste streams are you gonna generate this upcoming year? And try to manage your hazardous waste kind of forward thinking. Because what we're all here to do is protect the environment, make sure we have clean drinking water, that we have fish, and that our... So whether you're custodial staff or newly graduated geologists, we want them to work and learn in a safe and healthy environment. So, so we do have a lot of resources that we use to help put this together. Um, the presentation is on the website, so if you go through we have, I think, two pages of that. We also have our business cards up here. If you have any questions at all that we didn't answer, yes. Okay. Do we charge schools? Yeah, schools do have hazmat and hazardous waste permits. Yeah. Well, like we said earlier, we have done enforcement on one school district in our county and it was a business plan violation. Um, I could tell you from a political standpoint, we're not aggressive on that. I mean, that's the last thing you really wanna do is go hammer a school, but we also treat all our businesses equal. Um, I mean, in our county, we will find the state, we will find schools if they don't manage it correctly. So um, with some of these photos, they, they have been put on our enforcement list to look at, because um, we are seeing illegal disposal of hazardous waste, so yeah, we will do enforcement if it comes down to it. I haven't seen that. Um, potentially, though, I mean, it is a laboratory, That's and we've seen that at other laboratories, so it is, I mean, they are a laboratory. I mean, it's a small laboratory, but it's, it's still a waste. Yes, we, I mean, as long as they know what it is. Um, yeah, but they are labeling what it is. I mean, I haven't seen anywhere saying you need to label it in the English language. And, you know, it, it is a scientific formula. The people that are using it know exactly what it is. If I ask the person that's walking around the inspection with me, do you know what this is? Yes. Then I'm okay with it. Yes. From, I'm, we're part of the, I, I'm part of our, or used to be part of our IR team, and we did have an explosives lab in our county, and the guy had scientific formulas on everything, and he was an honest bad guy, because he told us that everything was labeled scientific formula. Our hazmat team, we went through there, and there was an app that we plugged it in, and it told us everything based on the scientific formula. As an emergency responder, I hate it, but in the, the regs, 
I mean, there's, I don't have really any backing to say you have to manage it with the English language sodium hypochlorite. You can't use a scientific formula because it just says, is it labeled identifying what the compounds are? Well, if he uses a scientific formula, he knows what it is. No, not on the waste. The waste has to be labeled as hazardous waste. Yeah, that's clearly stated. In the, the contents? I would ask your Koopa. I mean, if it, if it has that, I would, I mean, it, it is the contents. It's, it's one of those gray areas. So. 50 shades of gray. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Right, thank you.